We'll call the January 20th, 2015 Council Committee meeting to order. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Two of us are running a little bit behind from a, a ribbon cutting ceremony over at uh, Beacon Orthopedic, which is very nice. They are doubling the size of their facility uh, from 6,000 square feet to 12,000 square feet over across the highway. And um, some of us were also in a um, meeting with John Chamberlain, who's going to be talking here shortly about the um, auditor audit report. So um, we'll dive right in here. The first item on the agenda under the Economic Development and Finance Committee with uh, Mr. Blankenship and Ms. Pitts is the auditor's presentation of the audit report. Mr. Engelman, would you like to say anything? We have John Chamberlain from Van Gorder Walker here tonight to, to make a brief presentation on the, uh, on the audit report. Um, I'm going to pass out a, a copy of the, the um, uh, slides, I suppose, of the uh, release of slides. Or, yeah, okay. It's part of his presentation package. And Greg, we should make sure everyone has a set of financial statements as well. Uh, you sent those electronic, didn't you? Yeah, I sent a copy of those electronic. Uh, okay, well, they can, we can share or something like that because when we get them, we want to. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. My name is uh, John Chamberlain. I'm a uh, CPA and partner at Van Gorder Walker & Company, and uh, we're a CPA firm located in Erlanger, and uh, we're happy to audit our home city. It's a nice change, and um, we do appreciate the opportunity to uh, do this work for you. Uh, we are experts in governmental accounting. It's uh, the vast majority of our business, and so uh, uh, we, uh, we very much enjoy uh, the opportunity here. Um, I want to start by saying thank you very much uh, to Greg and Steve and your, your accounting staff. Uh, as I told the mayor earlier, you are very lucky to have someone of Greg's uh, skill, knowledge, and ability because uh, there aren't many uh, cities in northern Kentucky who have someone of his level in this position, and, and you are very lucky as a city to have him. Uh, and he didn't pay me any extra to say that, so I just want to point that out. Um, what we're here for, uh, you should have a slide pr um, presentation. Uh, you do have some uh, financial statements there in front of you. And then a letter. I'm going to hit the slide presentation first. Uh, what you pay us to provide is our opinion. And, and our opinion is that the financial position, the financial statements uh, present fairly in all material respects the financial position of the city of Erlanger um, as of uh, June 30th, 2014 in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. This is what we would call an unmodified opinion, meaning no modifications are attached to the opinion, and that's the highest opinion that we give. We also uh, do a required report on internal control and compliance. Um, we're proud to report that there are no uh, material weaknesses. Those would be large weaknesses in internal controls that, we're, that we are required to report. Uh, we did identify one significant deficiency in internal, rec um, in internal controls, and that's uh, audit finding 2014-01. Uh, 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 we will talk about that again in a moment. And um, there are no instances of noncompliance with laws, grants, or bond agreements. And uh, because you expended greater than uh, $500,000 in federal funds, we also were required to uh, do an, what we call an OMB A133 audit and uh, look at uh, your expenditure of federal funds. And uh, we have no instances of noncompliance uh, with, uh, with those requirements to report as well. 
I'd like to, uh, at this point, deviate a little bit and, and look at the letter uh, that we provided. Um, this letter uh, came out of the um, Enron scandal, <laughs> and uh, it's a letter from, um, from the auditor to uh, those in charge of governance, which in this, this city would be the city council. And it's our opportunity to report to you any issues that the city takes. Uh, if you have uh, what we would consider to be aggressive accounting positions, if we made significant uh, material adjustments, anything like that. Uh, this, this letter, uh, I'll let you read it on your own time. There's really only a couple of things that I want to point out. Uh, you do have some um, new accounting policies that came out of your 2013 audit, uh, where the audit findings that they had in 2013, you did make uh, appropriate adjustments to your accounting internal controls uh, and, and require um, um, yeah. purchase orders. Thank you. Required purchase orders uh, for uh, each one of your departments. And so, uh, so you've made those changes um, for your 2013 audit, so that's good to see. Uh, in the middle of page um, two of the letter, we reported that uh, we did have an audit finding and that uh, we made a reclassification of about $34,000 uh, from uh, expenses to accounts receivable, so reduce the expenses by about $34,000. So that's a, a, uh, an adjustment that we made. And then on page three, uh, there's uh, required reports on internal control and compliance uh, in the financial statements, and that refers to them. And then also that they, a management letter was issued uh, to Mark and to Greg um, detailing some small accounting management items that we thought, uh, that we thought should be pointed out. So all in all, a, a very um, bland letter with just a couple of items in it. I want to go to uh, some financial numbers now. Uh, this is your first slide that has your graph on it. It's actually slide six. And uh, it shows uh, your cash position, uh, that's the green bar, and your total assets across the last five years. You can see your cash position has been growing uh, steadily over the past five years at $9.3 million in unrestricted cash at June 30th, 2014. We like to um, use a rule of thumb in our business that says we'd like to have about one quarter or three months worth of operating expenses available in cash. Uh, for the city of Erlanger, that's about $4.2 million, and you can see you've got about $9.3 million in reserve. So a, a very strong uh, cash position, especially compared to uh, 2010, 2011, where you would not have met that simple rule of thumb that I mentioned. The next slide is a debt comparison across all funds. And you can see the, uh, the red bar is the uh, long-term portion of debt. That's uh, debt that's due from 2015 on. Uh, the orange is the debt due in the current year. And then the yellow bars are your current fund liabilities. Again, uh, your, uh, your long-term debt stepping down exactly like, as we would have expected it to uh, compared to your uh, bond covenants, your bond agreements. Uh, you, we did uh, compare your, um, your amounts due in the current year to your debt agreements, and those all match. So uh, again, those, uh, nothing there to be concerned about. This is revenues versus expenditures, um, all sources of your governmental funds. You can see there that, uh, that nice pretty separation between the two. The green line is the revenue, the red is the expenditures, and that, uh, that nice separation between the two is the amount of excess that you have uh, every year in, uh, in uh, cash uh, revenues over expenditures. Um, what this also shows me is an outstanding management to your revenues coming in the door by, by your, uh, your city administrator, your mayor, and the council, uh, that you do a good job of managing to the revenues that you have available. This next slide just shows for 2014 only uh, where, you've, where you spend your funds. Uh, total expenditures of roughly $16.9 million across the city. Um, the police department by far the largest of 5.3 million, the fire department about 3.5 million, um, capital outlay of 2.5 million, uh, public works of 2.2. I do want to point out um, just one thing on that slide and that is even though in the past few years you notice your cash position increasing, you also notice your uh, capital outlay is strong as well. So that means you are reinvesting funds back into the city. Uh, you're, not just, um, you're not just amassing cash 
cash, but not spending money on the residents' um, uh, residents' needs as far as your infrastructure goes. So that's good to see. That's a, a it's a very positive comment for the city. This is uh, police expenditures over the last five years. Um, the 7.7 percent increase there. Uh, the vast majority of that increase is where you rolled your dispatch uh, services over into the police expenditures this year. So that uh, uh, necessarily makes those expenditures more this year. Uh, fire expenditures are roughly the same from last year. Capital outlay again, you see there, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll just to harp on that just a little longer, uh, if you go back to 2010, you know, you're, uh, what, uh, three times more in capital outlay expenditures uh, this year than you were in 2010. So you can see that uh, uh, those extra funds uh, going to uh, the streets, the, the things that you see on the street. Public works expend, expenditures the same way. Uh, you know, public works, capital outlay, uh, you know, they're really, they go hand in hand, obviously, and the same, uh, same scenario there. And then general government expenditures, roughly just a small increase. Debt service, uh, you, uh, you did pay off your, uh, some of your debt uh, from your, um, uh, your former proprietary funds of your, uh, of your dispatch service. So you can see those expenditures decrease this year. And then your IT expenditures to round out all your governmental functions. Now, if you'll go to the financial statements themselves, uh, the mayor thought it would be a good idea if I read all 88 pages word for word, but I think I'm going to skip over some stuff. <laughs> the um, pages one through four is a transmittal letter. Um, just a, uh, this is required for the um, GFOA certificate that you receive every year for your financial statements from the Government Financial Officers Association. And uh, so it's just an overview of the city, what's going on in the city. And, and Greg writes this, and it, it's just an outstanding overview. And uh, it's, it's good uh, uh, for anyone uh, to read. It's good information. Uh, page seven, I'm just going to point that out. That's the Certificate of Achievement of Excellence in Financial Reporting. Again, you've had this, I think, for um, quite a few years in a row. And, um, and uh, you should get that again for 14, so we're pretty proud of that. Page nine is the auditor's opinion. Uh, that's three pages of accounting legalese to tell you that you had an unmodified opinion. Page 15 through 23 is the management's discussion and analysis. Again, this is, uh, this is more detailed financial overview uh, that uh, Greg writes, and it is an uh, encapsulation of what went, ha what went on in the year um, in the city financially. Uh, a lot of tables in here, some charts. Um, I do encourage all of you, it's a very good executive summary of the financial statements. So this may be the part, uh, I'm going to give a foot stomp for uh, this, the, the test that you have later will cover, uh, this will cover. <laughs> so uh, you, that's the part you may want to read. Page 25 is the statement of net position. And this is the uh, balance sheet, if you will, based on um, uh, as a business would run theirs. Uh, in other words, it has all of your long-term debt, it has your fixed assets in there. And you can see uh, the, the business type activities column has been zeroed out where you have all those assets have been, has been transferred over from your dispatch, have been transferred over to the, uh, to the government, part of, your, um, uh, part of your government. So your total assets of $32 million including $19.6 million of what we call long-term fixed assets. Those are roads, vehicles, buildings, that type of thing. Uh, $9.5 million in cash. Uh, total liabilities of uh, $5.7 million. Um, of that, uh, $3.5 million in long-term debt, roughly $800,000 due in debt that's due this year. So you take your total assets minus your total liabilities, and you get a net position of uh, $26.5 million. Page 27 is the balance sheet. 
This should look a little more similar to the reports that you get on a monthly basis. Uh, it does not have the fixed assets and the long-term debt included, and it's broken down by fund. You see there your total assets across all funds of $12.3 million, uh, $9.3 million of that in cash. Total liabilities, uh, $1.4 million. Assets minus your liabilities, the portion of your assets that you own, about uh, $10.8 million. Page 28 is the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Uh, this would be the income statement for the city, uh, and it should look very similar to the uh, income statements that you get on a monthly basis. You see there your total revenues is about $18.4 million across all funds. Total expenditures across all funds of $16.3 million for a net um, excess of about $2.1 million. You uh, did transfer funds between your governmental and your proprietary assets of the, in this year, so the net change across all funds of $1.8 million. Page 30, 31, and 32, um, those are the statement of net position of your proprietary funds. Again, um, uh, because you closed your dispatch fund during the year, um, page 31 shows your statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund in net position. And uh, that's really for a half a year and then the fund closed. So that's why that, those numbers are a little bit, um, are a little bit odd looking. The internal service fund listed there is your health and dental and vision, or health vision fund, or dental and vision, I'm sorry, dental and vision fund for all the city's employees. Pages 33 through 47 are the notes to the financial statements. And uh, a lot of information in the notes to the financial statements on uh, just about every topic that you could, uh, that you could uh, imagine. And uh, there's information on the, the capital assets there. There's information on the debt, on how the funds are set up. So I do encourage you to, uh, to at least uh, uh, peruse those. Um, I find them interesting. Page 49 is the uh, budgetary comparison schedule for the general fund. And I'm gonna walk you through one of these and uh, let you know how that fund is, how these things are set up. Uh, the first column you see there that says original, that's your original budget that you set uh, very early on. The next column are any amendments to that budget. The third column is your, your final budget for the city. And then the uh, fourth column over are the actual, so the actual revenues and the actual expenditures on each one of those budget line items. The fifth column over is a variance column. Uh, if it's a positive variance, that means you received more than you budgeted or you spent less than you budgeted, okay? If it's a negative, it's the reverse of each one of those. So you want, you want positive numbers in that far right-hand column on your variances. As you can see there, uh, you, you, uh, your amounts available for appropriation, you actually uh, had about $368,000 more available than what you had, uh, your amended budget. So, you know, just an outstanding, um, outstanding there. And then uh, total charges to appropriation, you actually spent uh, $418,000 less than what you budgeted to spend. Okay? Um, <laughs> that's uh, good, good management to budget. Yes, ma'am. That's actually what that is. Um, so that, uh, that same schedule exists for your capital assets fund on the next page and then two pages later on your, in your police forfeiture fund. Page 53 is the, um, is the schedule of federal expenditures. And the city did, uh, because the city expended more than $500,000 of federal funds, uh, again, we were required to do the A133 audit. You see there you expended $628,000 of federal funds, and this schedule breaks down uh, each of the areas that those funds, from which those were spent. Page 55 and 56, 57. Um, it's the uh, Independent Auditor's Report on Internal Control and Compliance. Uh, this is where we, uh, we mentioned the uh, significant deficiency in the audit finding uh, that's, uh, that's been uh, well reported. And uh, also no issues of compliance to report there. 
page 59 and 61 is the independent auditor's report on compliance with internal control uh, over major federal programs. Uh, this, uh, again, is part of the federal, um, the federal report uh, in your financial statements. Um, no issues of noncompliance and uh, lack of internal controls over expenditure of federal funds to report. Almost there. Page 63 is the um, uh, schedule of findings and question costs. Again, this is a part of the, uh, the federal A133 audit. This is where we would report um, any, um, any um, audit findings that we have in federal programs. And uh, page 64, uh, that's where we mention the significant deficiency in internal control uh, for the current year. Page 65 is where we mention prior year findings and how they were solved. Okay. Page 69 through 88 is the statistical section. Uh, this section is required uh, for any uh, GFOA report. And just a lot of data in here. Uh, this is 10 years worth of data on most, in most items um, across about everything that you can imagine uh, statistically within the city. And um, so I do encourage you to, uh, to look through that. There is a lot of information there. I know that's uh, a lot of information to throw at you in one sitting, but um, uh, again, if you have questions, um, I've given each of you my business card and it's on the slide presentation as well. If you have, um, if you have questions, feel free to contact me. Your, um, your finance director, as I mentioned, knows more than I do. Um, he's been around longer, but um, he, um, he is an outstanding resource to the city. And, um, and, and, and he will be able to answer any question that you may have. If you have concerns or there's something you don't feel comfortable talking to Greg about, you can definitely talk to me. And uh, we do work for you as the city council. So um, you can feel free to contact us with any concerns that you may have. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, the next item on the agenda is the text amendment request. Dave, do you want to talk about that? I, I'm, I'm not aware. I know that uh, Mark Stewart brought that up, brought this up at last council meeting. I don't know how much about this he talked to you about, so I'm going to assume he didn't. Uh, give you much information just so I'm, I'm getting into here yeah so uh, uh, for about a year we've been working with Family Dollar uh, who's uh, came to us gave us a call to look to for a relocation of their Ellesmere uh, spot um, I showed them a, two or three different spots and they finally decided on the on the, the spot between what is new McGalpin heading south to the, what would be the tattoo place. They're going to take all of that property and, and build their family dollar. Um, however, when we were going through all this, uh, it, it came to light that in, in uh, May of 1990, the city passed an ordinance, ordinance number 1948, which it had a whole bunch of different zoning changes in it to the NC zone, which is the zone that this property is within, uh, and it took out the use of variety store, was the, the one of the uses that came out of there. Uh, don't know why, um, uh, maybe Frank remembers that, but I don't. <laughs> but anyway, the only thing I can think of is all of the uses that a variety store is, or in our opinion, is already listed in there. like. You know, the, the glass and pottery stores, hardware stores, food stores, all that sort of thing. So I would assume that that's why it was, that particular use was taken out. Uh, we feel the family dollar store, as they are, would be a permitted use in that zone. We've let them know that and told them that if they would apply, apply for a zoning permit, we would issue them one. Uh, and they're, they're happy with that and glad of that. and. All that stuff. However, they feel that they would, they'd feel more comfortable if the 
old use of variety store was back as a permitted use within that neighborhood commercial zone like it was. So this one's a little different than most of the zoning. Normally we're telling people no, that that doesn't fit. And and they're, they're ready to go and want the changes and all this stuff. This one we're saying they fit and okay, but they, they want that back in. So that is the request that they are asking is that we amend the text in the neighborhood commercial zone to add the use of variety stores as a permitted use within that zone. Yes, uh, we do, and that was one of the second things I was going to talk about here, okay. is that, is that, and that's okay, is the, the Renaissance, because that is also in the neighborhood commercial with the, a Renaissance overlay. Yeah. Now, there's, there's a bunch of things in that that, as I, as I was going to talk about a little bit tonight, if, if, if I could, um, of trying to either get rid of that or amend that. But, but you're right, that, that particular overlay zone does have some, some building of how, how a building should look built into it when, when that ordinance was passed, oh, those many years ago. So, so that is in there. What I was going to talk about was, you know, there, there was the Renaissance program we had here in the city, and there's the... the, the there's a, a guideline for the Renaissance guidelines, and then it's the zoning ordinance. And, they, and they're, in many cases, they're different. But the way it reads, that if there's a difference, then the Renaissance uh, guidelines govern how, how it's developed, is the way it's written. That has caused some issues. Um, and, and what's happening is, since it's in the zoning regulations, as far as setbacks and such, they appeal those to the Board of Adjustments, and the Board of Adjustments grants those variances to, to the folks, and therefore not, not following those guidelines as, as written. So these two, as you all know, that what I told you about tonight with the family dollar, that could cause some issues with those setbacks of what they want to do. The new development that, that uh, we spoke about with the uh, the CVS, that's another, another one as far as setbacks that are required. So I was just going to bring up tonight if we wanted to look at possibly uh, amending the, the zoning regulations to get rid of those or amending them to somehow so that we don't continually have these disagreements between the two codes that, that are in effect. Because we've been fighting them since they've been since they've been adopted, and the Board of Adjustments always sides with, with the, with the uh, developer and allows to build more in conformity with the zoning regulations. Well, as you and I discussed, back in the day, 40 years ago, they built all of the buildings right on the Right road. close to the road. And it has created problems for us for years with new development. It would yeah. be my suggestion that we flip that in, the, in order to bring the new business. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The Renaissance in mind. That just makes that block so much nicer. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Oh, oh you got God. all the way up to yeah. tattoo parlor and then you got first. Yeah, they're taking, they're taking all the way up to the, it, that, the that garage that's, oh, that right. the, yeah. they're going to take that. Yes. Then the parking lot is going to be gone. Yes. The curb cuts will be the limited. Car, yes. Cars. Yeah. Yes. I think it's a no-brainer. We're, we're going to talk to them to, as you know, in that stretch, the sidewalks. That's in the area where the sidewalks have been. We're going to, we've talked to CVS, and they seemed receptive to taking what we've done on in the front to do with their curb cuts and their sidewalks and their uh, planning areas, and and we'll work with with the family dollar as well to get that to try to get them to uh, take that up. Dave, you might point out that the when we did the McGuffin's intersection, we took away a curb cut. 
Yes. Uh, to put in the bus stop, and we also then re restored a curb cut on McGoppin Avenue, so there was a, an opportunity to Correct. come out and use the traffic light. Yes. So that whole corner has those two opportunities. Yes. Are they still going to be having the entrance and exit on Dixie Highway? What what they're showing now is one curb cut on the Dixie Highway. On to Dixie Highway, okay. and then the one that comes comes out uh, the, that we put in off of McAlpin, so they can get to the traffic signal. Okay. Yeah. I just turn it left on Dixie going north. Is what I'm worried about. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not familiar with the Renaissance and guidelines. Okay. Um, but what kind of building? Is this going to be one of the steel buildings sitting up around the corner? There? I have. We have not seen any any building plans yet. We're just at this point looking at the site plan of how the building and curb cuts and such are going to be situated on the property. We haven't gotten to the to the building plans yet. Kind of, it's kind of a weak uh, comparison, but when Richie's Car Wash wanted to come in, we were just sickened by the thought of that having a car wash at the corner of Graves and Dixie. We couldn't imagine how it looked, but he adhered to every single guideline, mm -hmm. and it, it's a very attractive. It's still a car wash, but it's it's, it's it, it it requires a bit more masonry and and that sort of thing on on the buildings and uh, build closer to the road than what's required by the zoning regulations and but those are the the, the things that they're going to the boards of adjustments and getting varied. And we're not saying we're completely lifting those, correct? That's what I that's was I wanted to get clarified too of what we wanted to do with that if. You know, if, if, if. I, I've seen some of these other family dollars, Dollar Tree kind of buildings. Yeah. Of these just metal shacks. Okay. That look like, and, that, I and that's not what you're we're, you're wanting to see. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. Well, maybe maybe the best way to go then is is not to make a decision here tonight. Is let us go through the regulations go through them and, and get back with you all what what these regulate because sitting here right now I, I don't get into them that often so I can make a, a I can give you all a, a list of of what it would mean if we were to completely get rid of those what kind of building could then could be built because if those regulations are not in effect all someone has to do is comply with the building code and, and you're right then it could be a metal building or a What's the actual you know name of the company it's not Dollar Tree this one's called Family Dollar. Yeah. Family Dollar is across the street right now. It's, right? it's across the street right now. Right, yes. So why do they want to come onto our side? I mean, is the, the they just want a freestanding building, bigger, <coughs> more square foot. Yeah, they're a tenant. Uh -huh. They're a tenant in, in the existing they want more building. Market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, are they and they're a tenant, right, Mayor? That they're 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 leasing and they want to own and be bigger and be their freestanding. They seem to be going like the. Um, you know, there's a bunch of them now. The Dollar Generals, they're, try, they're going to freestanding type businesses. And the drugstores or the CVSs and the Walgreens are going to freestanding stores instead of being in a, in a complex or a strip park, center. Excuse me. Is the parking going to be on the side or in the back? The parking to be on what I've seen on the site plan, like on both sides of the building. The front and the side. I'm sorry. Dixie Highway and the McAlpin side. Okay. Yes. Yeah, planning and zoning would still need to, to approve the plan. I think tonight we're just talking about the concept. We really can't vote well, the, on, no, no. on what you're talking about. No, you're, no. You're just introducing it to us. I'm the, right. The planning and zoning. This on the on the family dollar one, if if you want me to to add the use of variety stores to that, then yeah. The, the, the mayor's right. I'd have to, we'd have to file an application to the planning commission to add that use as a permitted use within the neighborhood commercial zone. That has nothing to do with the, how the building will, will look. That's just the use yeah. itself. But in the meantime, we probably should get brushed up on what the Renaissance. Right. So I will. We will work on getting what what the the Renaissance stuff actually says and how it would you differ. Oh, well, sure. Well. <laughs> Hate to discourage. So we can do that, and and I'll and I'll get that out to you all uh, soon. Great. No. Okay. Okay.
Thanks a lot. All right, the next item under the administration committee is the mayor's termination authority ordinance. Mr. Wickman. Yes, sir. Um, we have previously provided you a copy of a proposed ordinance. It's in draft form only. It's certainly not final. Also given you a memorandum in regard to the backgrounds behind that. Uh, what we're going to be talking about now is what is known as at-will employment and KRS 83A.139. Uh, generally speaking, at-will employment is a concept that says that unless there's a statute or a contract that provides otherwise, the employment relationship between an employer and an employee is quote unquote at will. And what that means is both the employer and the employee can terminate that relationship anytime they want to for any reason or no reason. KRS 83.139 doesn't use the term, quote, at, at will. Those words don't appear in the statute, but it's been interpreted to mean that the employment relationship between a municipal employer and a municipal employee is, quote, at will unless there's a statute or an ordinance that provides otherwise. There are statutes that provide otherwise, <coughs> basically 95-450 in regard to our kind of classification of a city. And it, uh, it uh, provides protection to members of the police department and the fire department from termination except for cause and after a due process hearing. For many years, the city of Erlanger had no ordinance that terminated or that protected employees from at-will employment termination. But, oh, I guess it was about 20 years ago, there was a candidate for mayor who was uh, indicating that he was going to replace a long-term city clerk by the name of Wilma LeBear. City council and mayor weren't in favor of that, so we enacted an ordinance that uh, provided uh, protection to her from at will termination authority. That was on the books for a while and then it was amended to provide that the uh, originally it just required as I recall a uh, due process hearing and some reason for the termination. Then later on it was amended to provide that the, uh, the, the mayor's termination authority was restricted to at cause with a um, due process hearing in which the uh, hearing had to be conducted by an attorney that was selected uh, by the city attorney from attorneys, local attorneys with municipal experience and that um, it had to be a due process hearing at which the the uh, city attorney, or not the city attorney, but the attorney that was selected would prepare what are known as factual determinations from evidence that was presented, and the mayor was limited to those factual determination in making his decision. Later on, we got to the current ordinance, which provides that the termination of the mayor is subject to the approval of the city council. Now, KRS 83A.130.9 uh, authorizes the city council to restrict the at-will termination authority of the mayor. There's also another statute that provides that the city council shall not engage in executive functions unless they are assigned to the city council by statute. That created sort of a conflict between those two statutes. And as anticipated, there was uh, much discussion among attorneys about whether or not the authority of KRS 139 authorized the city council to 
restrict the mayor's authority by requiring their approval. Uh, and you could talk to municipal attorneys and some of them will be on one side of the argument, some of them will be on the other side of the argument. I was on the side that said the city council could do that until recently. And that is uh, what happened recently is that I became aware of a federal judge's opinion for the United States Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati that said I was wrong, said the statute uh, did not, that any, any requirement by the city council for the approval of a termination conflicted with the separation of the executive authority and the legislative authority. Now, when attorneys disagree about the interpretation of statutes, that's one thing. When a federal judge weighs in and tells you what the interpretation is going to be, that's something else. And given that judicial decision, which only occurred in 2013, that required me to recalculate my reasoning. And I'm pretty well convinced that although that federal judicial decision is not compelling or binding upon a Kentucky court, it certainly is persuasive, and I'm convinced that uh, that determination, if it was ever litigated in Kentucky, would be that the city council does not have the authority to subject the termination authority of the mayor to their approval. With that determination, we have an ordinance that does that. And I'm pretty <coughs> convinced that if it was ever litigated, it would be determined to be invalid. With that determination, I have to recommend to you that we need to revise that ordinance, and that is the subject of tonight's, opinion, or tonight's meeting. I've provided you with a proposed ordinance that does that, but alternatively provides more restrictions on the termination authority of the mayor than we have in our present ordinance. Uh, that ordinance is not final because it needs, it needs some work. And the reason it needs work is, number one, it, it is in conflict with the personnel policies that you all adopted just last year. Those personnel policies uh, are replete with references to the fact that employees of the city of Erlanger, other than members of the police department and fire department, are at-will employees. The ordinance that we've provided to you in draft form is just the opposite. It's, uh, it protects employees from the at-will termination authority of the mayor. So those provisions of those personnel policies and the ordinance that I've presented to you are not consistent, and they need to be worked on to provide that consistency. So what I need to know from you all tonight, number one, do you agree that the existing ordinances of the city need to be amended to eliminate the restriction on the mayor's authority to the approval of the city council? That's number one. Number two, what we have now does not extend to all city employees. The proposed ordinance that we've drafted for you does extend that protection to their employment to all city employees. And I need to know if you agree with that or if you want to limit that protection to certain classes of those employees, such as unelected city officials, department heads, or whatever. So with that introduction, I'll entertain any discussion. I, I, have a, I do have a question. Um, I looked at the original Mark Otto one that we had that we yeah. revised with the Tom Rouse one. Yep. And then I looked at your new one. Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm looking at it. I want to know why in the second paragraph it goes back to the original Mark Otto one and says that 
uh, already protected tenure in terms of the employment of, it, it, said, it lists police officers here that, that they're also, for, you know, they, it includes police officers and it, and you, and I know for a fact, police officers and fire department are protected by the state. We can't do anything about that. That's, they're they're right. totally protected by the state. But in here, you're only saying police officers. You're not saying the fire, you, not in the second paragraph, you're only saying police officers. But then when you go down further to it, you said, but excluding members of the police or fire department. <coughs> so you're saying the police and the fire <coughs> bottom, but at the top, you're only saying police. Then that was a typographical error, police and fire just in the same situation. Okay, they that, are, yeah, that was in the Mark Otto one, but we dropped it out of the Tom Rouse one, and, I, and now the, it's back in yeah, the, the new one. one. The one section I saw was, it was in the definitions where we were newly yeah, defining. Yeah, the definition of employee. Right, yeah. right. right. Okay. We define employee to exclude members of the police and fire department. Okay, so that second that paragraph then, that just needs to be deleted. From the, this is, the you're point. talking about t paragraph 2.1? Is that where I'm just trying to find where you are, Kathy? I'm on the, the ordinance, um, whereas KRS 15, 520, and 95.40. It's the second oh, okay. paragraph. Right. That's the new it ordinance. Says, yeah, the new one. It's the new one. Yeah, this is in the new one? Yeah, the new yeah, it's one. The new the one you drafted. You got, yeah, the one oh, you so you, you, want to, you want that first line to say, in terms of the employment of the police officers and fire department. Well, I guess because it. Because it is. I mean, there's, that's the way yeah, the, the city says we can't do anything to police or fire or EMS. Bottom line is we can't. Right here. Oh, the whereas clause? Yeah. You found my path either in that first statute. Right here. Because I don't think you totally like this. The second paragraph is all I no. talk about. Okay. You're right. That should, that first whereas, second whereas clause should reference both police officers and firefighters. Right, because then you define an employee as, it says, but excluding police and fire department down under the definition of employee. You do exclude both, but yeah, I hear and, you don't. Yeah, the word employee excludes, is defined to exclude those. Okay. So the ordinance has no effect on them. Okay. Go ahead. No, I was gonna add, the first whereas references the KRS 139 as I read, um, is there any conflict between uh, KRS 83A083, which, which deals with the non-elected officers? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. I was wondering if what we've drafted here has any conflict because there's two sections of, um, of the statutes that deal with termination the mayor's authority to terminate, one dealing specifically with the employees, the other dealing with not elected officers. But we haven't referenced to address the not elected officers statute that I saw in here. Well, really, there's only one statute that addresses police and firefighters. Well, with police and firefighters. Right. But I wasn't sure because we're now cl reclassifying what's an employee, KRS 83A083, section 3, references non elected officers. It's not in here. I was just doing some supplementary reading. Yeah, the the prior ordinances were restricted to non-elected officers. The proposed ordinance applies to all employees other than police and firefighters. That that part again. I, I was just I wasn't sure if there were any conflicts between this new proposed ordinance and the two different parts of the the, the Kentucky statute that reference. There is not. Employees versus there not is elected no, officers. There is no conflict. Gary, are you saying that you think it needs to be referenced in that I, first I, I whereas? Know, I, and now that we're redefining employees. That, that we reference KRS 83A.080, number three, and .130, number okay. nine. I think that's what he's, we'll have to yeah. Yeah, look at that.
Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, in response to your specific questions, I do think we need to amend the existing ordinance. You know, we've talked about this a lot, and I've studied the law in this area, and I, I think you're right. In light of the federal judge's opinion, it's not binding, but I, I agree with pretty persuasive on a state court looking at the issue. Uh, so I think that portion of our existing ordinance that requires city council approval would be held invalid if it got challenged in court. So we need to do something with the ordinance to uh, fix that because right now if that part of the ordinance is, the ordinance that we, as we have now has a severability clause. So if that part of the ordinance is held invalid, we have an ordinance saying they can't be terminated except in certain instances of misconduct and that they have a hearing but there's no statement as to who does the hearing, how the hearing is done, what was done. It says they get due process but doesn't specify what their process will be. So I think we do need to fix the statute uh, or the ordinance, excuse me, and I think we need to look at it you know, the question about should we extend it to all city employees, I think we should. I think it's artificial to have a distinction to say this level of employees get the protection and this level do not. So I, I agree with the pro approach to extend that to all the employees. Uh, I think the ordinance that Frank has drafted is a good step in the right direction. My only concern with the statute, or the ordinance, I'm sorry, is the hearing itself. Um, doesn't specifically say who's going to do the hearing, and I'm presuming from that that the mayor would do the hearing. And the problem I have with that is he's the one who levels the charges against the person and conducts the hearing sometimes. Yeah. And it's hard to be the prosecutor and the judge in a case. I know if I were the person on trial, I would feel very uncomfortable with that. I know it happens sometimes, frankly, in administrative hearings. Uh, I've done a lot of administrative hearings, and I, it's not a very fair process. Um, so I would rather see us go back to something more like we had before where we have an outside attorney designated to sit as the judge in the case, make the findings of fact and conclusions of law and the recommendation. And the only thing I would say is we probably want to expand who is the attorney to do it. In the ordinance we had before, it was simply somebody in the Northern Kentucky Bar Association, uh, generally speaking. And it had to, I think it had to be in the municipal government section or something to that effect, wasn't it, Frank? It was, and that was the reason for my recommendation to change the ordinance then because, quite frankly, the last time this issue came up, I had great difficulty in finding an attorney that was willing to do that. Right, because the... Probably the, the main problem was they knew everybody and right. they just didn't want to get involved in that process. And so my thought would be, as we say, instead of saying the Northern Kentucky Bar Association, just the Kentucky Bar Association, because you're going to less likely have that idea of, well, I know the parties involved, because you know, I don't think it's very, very fair to have a judge who knows the parties either. I mean, that would be what a judge would normally disqualify himself for, from hearing a case. So I think we ought to direct that differently and say it should be any member of the Kentucky Bar Association with experience in this area that can be designated to hear the, hear the case and make the recommended decision. I think that gives us the neutrality that you want from a judge, not the lack of knowledge of the parties, and will result in a fairer hearing generally. How about requiring it be a, somebody outside of Northern Kentucky? Probably not a bad idea uh, to make it be somebody outside of Northern Kentucky, because even if they don't know the people, they're going to know of the people. They're going to know somebody who knows the people. I mean, so I, I would probably worry not about a bad the cost idea. of what that would What's well, yeah. going to cost? I mean, yeah. I mean, if you get somebody from Bowling Green or Paducah or Lexington to come up here, they're going to have to have that hearing. They're probably going to spend a day, probably a night. So you're day talking day about day spending day. some money. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Can we can we do it? Where just keep mm -hmm. the Kenton County attorneys out of it. If they want the hearing, yeah. I don't even know well, that. Well. To me, I mean, I the answer is yes, you can, but is that going to be effective? Well, I don't know if it's going to be effective because then you're going to have Boone County who's going to know all the police officers and fire department. Mm -hmm. That's our biggest issue is, is like you say, Boone County, Camp, Kenton County, and Campbell. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we go farther out, it's going to be cost. We're going to have to take care of the hearing. And everything. Yes, you're going to. That's correct. Yeah, and they only have I would think if, it, if the wording was that the person is chosen by the, the city attorney, uh, I know it might be difficult to find someone, but I think that's going to make it more impartial if, you, if you're selecting it. Well, I can do that, but with my past experience, I'm almost telling you it's going to be somebody outside of northern Kentucky. Yes. Well, could we? Uh, so it is. Okay. Could you keep it? But I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily rule it that way. Okay. I mean, How about, could, can we have the KLC it? I don't think they'll do it. Assign an attorney? I don't think they'll do it. Okay. I'm just asking because if we pay them, I mean, you know. 
Yeah, we, right. Well, but I, I, I've not asked them, but I, I'm, I'm just I'd be willing exactly. to bet money they wouldn't want to get involved in that. Well, under the, I under, understand. Oh, I'm sorry. Under the prior ordinance, you you would designate the attorney, did, wasn't it? So the <coughs> yeah. attorney did? Yes, sir. Well, I, why don't we just say any to me it makes sense to say any member of the Kentucky Bar Association. That way we're not necessarily mandating it be somebody outside this area, but certainly if you run into the conflict, because, I mean, mm -hmm. lower-level employees are not necessarily going to be known by all the people, whereas if you're hiring a, firing a department head or something, they may, very well might be. So, I mean, let's just say, you know, to me, if a member could... If you can get somebody local who doesn't know the people, I see no problem with that. But you want to have the option to go outside Northern Kentucky should that situation arise. Okay. Could you could you go within a could you specify it with be within a 100 mile radius or something to that effect where? It's, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Being that I'm not a lawyer, I don't necessarily understand that. We're pretty close to Cincinnati. I mean, would that not work or? Is I, don't so. that I don't think so. I don't think so because it's Cincinnati. Well, I don't think, I don't well think they have, have to be a member of the Kentucky Bar Association, but uh, there's members of the, C, uh, the, the, the Kentucky Bar Association that are in Cincinnati. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, they have to be a Kentucky lawyer. But if, if you don't limit it to Indiana, the, Kentucky, Ohio. if you make it that we could, Ohio. you could go outside of Kentucky into Ohio or, in, or Indiana <coughs> or any other adjoining states, their municipal laws are different, and they're. Expensive. Outside Very attorneys' good. experience with those laws are going to be mm. intentionally or unintentionally influenced by that decision. Okay. I think. So I don't think that's a good idea. My, my only thing, my only thing is I, I look at all that and I understand I'm not a lawyer, so you know what you're talking. Yeah. I'm going to say you know what you're talking about. I hope and I'm going to listen to you. <laughs> I'm just I'm going to listen to you what you're saying to me, but. Again, if our lawyer picks a lawyer that he wants to hear it, he's going to choose somebody <laughs> that's going to agree with him. Maybe not. Um, I'm, but our lawyer would well, it's not really the firing. attorney that's that's. He's going to pick the attorney though. Yeah, but he's our not the one. Our attorney's going to pick the attorney that's going to hear it. That's just like the judge being the prosecutor. But he's not the one firing. Mm, uh, them. To me, that would be far different because he's just designating who the who the person deciding the case will be. And there's and you can't when you go to pick somebody to decide a case you you really don't know how they're going to decide it. I think that I think that puts a level of neutrality in there that would be sufficient. There's no other way to really do it. Somebody's got to pick them. Yeah. And I mean, to me, you, if you if you have the, the the person the mayor picking the the attorney, that has more of a taint to it because he's the one recommending the firing. Whereas the city attorney's not recommending the firing. He's just saying, here's the person who's going to hear the case. So I I think that gets more neutrality and. And there's really no other way to pick it because under the ordinances, the city council can't pick it because we're supposed to not be involved in that termination decision. Well, luckily, we haven't had this come up all that often. Thankfully, yeah. Why can't the person that's been fired hire their own frickin' attorney? Well, well they no, will. They'd be hiring well, the judge they will. what they're hiring. But there's someone that has to oversee the due process hearing. Yeah. Oh. No, if they, they'd have to hire their attorney if they want an attorney. We're talking about this attorney sitting as the judge in the case. And no, we don't want the person being fired to pick the judge, because then they probably would pick somebody to go their way. I'd like to be able to hire my judge, too. Yeah, go ahead, Renee. <laughs> Renee, did you? Yes, I had a question. You keep saying Northern Kentucky. Northern Kentucky is not only Boone, Kenton, and Campbell. There's seven counties that's considered Northern Kentucky. Boone, Campbell, Kenton, Owen, Grant, Pendleton, and Bracken. That are part of the, that, is that what the region is for the yeah, that's, bar? That's, that's the area development the district. Kentucky Bar Association, because there's Ohio attorneys that are on the Kentucky Bar Association, so we can use yeah. Ohio attorneys and the whole state of Kentucky. I would think that anybody who's on northern Kentucky be would also be in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah you, if you're an attorney licensed in Kentucky, you have to be a member of the Kentucky Bar Association. But you don't have to be a member of the northern Kentucky Bar Association. Right. Right, but I'm just saying your, your circumference just got bigger by excluding.